I am so honored, humbled, and proud to present this award to my friend, the consummate humanitarian, Mariska Hargitay. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, I have to say, Kim, that my most uh, instinctual response uh, to receiving this award is uh, to hand it back to you. Truly. Um, thank you for uh, all the good that you have done in this world, Kim, and thank you for multiplying it. Um, if you all heard a loud thump about a month or so ago, maybe two, that was my jaw hitting the floor um, at the list of past winners of this award. And um, this, is a lot to, this is a lot to take in. And I, I really need to say I am so uh, deeply, deeply uh, honored and deeply humbled uh, to be counted uh, among their numbers. So I thank you to the Board of Governors and the Board of Selectors for that. Um, my two favorite words have already come up already. So I just want to say, I think you said, uh, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but it doesn't matter because you can know what I'm talking about. Um, spirit is the essence of joy, or joy is the essence of spirit. And the other word is empathy. Empathy. Everything. Compassion. Everything. So I'm sure that you can imagine that when I walked uh, into a casting office 20 years ago uh, for a new cop show that was on TV, or when I got my first piece of fan mail, uh, when a survivor disclosed her story of abuse, or when I founded the foundation in 2004, I didn't have the faintest, faintest notion that I would be standing on the stage today. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm standing here trying to keep it together because the fact that this award is metal <laughs> makes me think of my father, um, who was awarded many medals for his feat of strength um, and whose shoulders I stand on every single day. Um, for those of you who are very young, my dad was Mickey Hargitay. <laughs> you can Google it. Um, <laughs> just to keep you in the know. Um, so when I, when I um, heard the name of the award, Outstanding Service for Benefiting the Disadvantaged, I have to admit that I, um, I stumbled a little bit on the word disadvantaged because in all the years that I've worked around the issues of sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse, and from my very first days of, of SVU, um, you know, 20 years ago, to our 15th, uh, which is now our 15th year in Joyful Heart Foundation, I've never thought or classified uh, survivors as disadvantaged. So Merriam-Webster defines disadvantaged as lacking in the basic resources or conditioned believed to be necessary for an equal position in society. So if we're going to call survivors disadvantaged, and if that means that they lack resources, what are the resources that they're lacking? Jean Amory was a Holocaust survivor, part of the resistance movement in Belgium before he was captured and sent to Auschwitz. And in his book, At the Mind's Limit, he talks about being tortured. So remarkably, he compares torture to rape because of the degree to which the self is violated in both instances. He says, whoever has succumbed to torture can no longer feel at home in the world. It blocks the view into a world in which the principle of hope rules. A part of the life ends 
and can never be revived. So I want to thank Jean Amory for providing the answer to what uh, those basic resources and conditions are that survivors are lacking. Hope, trust, a sense of safety, and the ability to feel at home in this world. I also want to say that what has sustained me in this work and it, what has uh, moved me and brought me to tears again and again and again is the courage uh, of survivors to reclaim those very resources. The courage to reclaim hope, to reclaim trust, to reclaim their right to have a place and a voice, and maybe even justice in this world. How much strength that requires cannot be overstated. Yes, survivors are indeed profoundly disadvantaged, rendered so at the hands of not only the perpetrators who committed the crimes against him, but by our society who blames them for what happened, who shames them for what happened, that has for so many years fostered a culture of silence and created near ideal conditions for perpetrators to perpetrate again. And thankfully, because of the work of so many, many, many unsung advocates and the strength and the power and the visibility of remarkable groups of survivors who continue to raise their voices uh, in remarkable and powerful ways that the culture of silence is being forever transformed, the long-awaited deeply needed change is coming. And that is why I feel so privileged to do this work, to be able to participate in a changing world. And more specifically, changing how survivors experience the world. And I want to say to all of us to never, ever, ever Underestimate the power that you have to change the course of a survivor's life. The simple act of listening without judgment, without agenda, without blame, is so often the most generous act of service that you can render. So I don't need to tell anybody in this room about the, these issues and how much work there is to be done. In the 20 years that I've been doing this show, and again in 15 since the Foundation's founding, the statistics that first inspired me haven't moved much. They've, the needle has moved, obviously, a little bit. But I know in my heart that this violence can and will end. Maybe not in my lifetime, um, but I'm holding that. I feel so grateful to know that when we are working with anyone who is disadvantaged, anyone who lacks resources, that we ourselves, with our hunger for change, our insistence on hope, and possibly most importantly, the willingness to serve is without a doubt the greatest resource there is. I am humbled, I am grateful. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for this very meaningful award. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back for another year the incredible performers from the Harlem School of the Arts and their Herb Alpert Center.